This is Your Morning Basket, where we help you bring truth, goodness, and beauty to your homeschool day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 31 of the Your Morning Basket podcast. I'm Pam Barnhill, your host, and I am so happy that you are joining me here today. Well, this is actually such a fun topic for me because, as most of you know, I am somewhat of a gadget geek. I love my technology, for better or for worse. And today I am chatting with Miss Lena Sutherland, who also uses quite a bit of technology in her morning time. She has what we call kind of a digital morning time. Now, Lena and I are going to talk about what she does, and I want you to take away from this what might work for your family. It might not work for you to do a completely digital morning time like Lena does, but on the other hand, there might be some other really great little tips that you could take away that you would enjoy that adding one or two technological elements might make your morning time just run a little smoother. So take what you will and enjoy the conversation. We'll get right onto it after this word from our sponsor. This episode of the Homeschool Snapshots podcast is brought to you by Maestro Classics. Do you want to bring classical music into your children's lives? You can add music to your homeschool curriculum today with Maestro Classics. These award-winning CDs and MP3s feature storytellers Yadu and Jim Weiss, accompanied by the world-famous London Philharmonic Orchestra. Choose from a dozen titles, including Peter and the Wolf, the Nutcracker, and our family's favorite, The Story of Swan Lake. What makes Maestro Classic CDs so special is that each CD and MP3 contain a 24-page activity book with illustrations, puzzles, games, and fun facts for kids. You can even download free curriculum guides that combine classical music with science, math, geography, and other subjects. All CDs and MP3 sets include tracks, which explain to your children how the music was made, who the composer was, the history and story behind the music, the instruments used by the orchestra, and most importantly, how to open your ears and really listen. Listening is a learned art, and Maestro Classics guarantees that these recordings will explain and develop listening skills in your children. Visit maestroclassics.com for free shipping on all CDs and MP3s. They start at just $9.98. As a Homeschool Snapshots listener, you can receive 17% off your order by using the coupon code PAM at checkout. Go to www.maestroclassics.com. That's maestro, spelled M-A-E-S-T-R-O, classics.com, where the best classical music curriculum awaits your homeschool. Lena Sutherland is a homeschooling mom of seven and self-proclaimed computer geek. She writes about homeschooling, faith, parenting in the digital age, and more at her blog, Homeschooling Without Training Wheels. Through her blog, Lena is also the host of The Bike Shed, an online resource where she shares some of her ideas with other homeschool moms. Morning time at Lena's house is high tech, and she joins us on this episode to discuss the benefits and practical how-tos of using technology as a morning time tool. Lena, welcome to the program. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start off by talking just a little bit about your morning time and what it currently looks like. Well, I'm glad you asked me about that because what our morning time currently looks like is somewhere in the middle between the high tech that we've had previously and the non-tech that we started out with. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we currently have a toddler. We've nicknamed him our ninja toddler. And he is very active, as I'm sure many people's toddlers are. And so right now, we've kind of switched things up, as I know homeschool moms have to do. So right now in the morning, our morning time is very brief. It's basically prayer, Bible reading. We sing a few hymns, and we maybe have one picture book or something like that that we're able to fit in. And we've swapped a lot of our digital activities to the afternoon. And I'll be happy to tell you more about what our morning time has looked like at various stages. But I just wanted to throw that out there because even when you find a system that is fantastic and it works, life happens. And as a homeschool mom, we know that our families go through seasons and we have to flex. So I just thought, you know, as I'm coming on here as this technology geek and proclaiming the benefits of technology, I wanted to start out by saying, 
even when you find a workable solution, you have to adapt to the various seasons of life. Oh, definitely. You have to roll with those seasons. So essentially, you're kind of doing two morning times. You're doing what we would call our standard morning time in the morning, and then you're waiting for that toddler to hopefully go down for a nap and doing the more robust one in the afternoon. Exactly. Awesome. And I love the way you're making that work for your family. Well, let's talk a little bit about how your morning time has looked in the past when it was a little more technology heavy and not so toddler plagued. You're right, exactly. So, well, you know, this journey actually began when the children were much younger. And I think many moms I've talked to have gone through that phase of, you know, that eventually you're planning to homeschool, but maybe all of your children are, you know, preschool age and you're kind of trying to figure out what am I supposed to be doing during the day with all the children. And we started out with just before I even knew the term morning time or morning basket or any of that, we would just start out with a little story in the morning and we would sing some songs just as kind of something to do after breakfast. And then we eventually began discovering that there was so much out there that could be learned through singing. And we started incorporating different CDs that we could sing along to and learn all kinds of different various things as we were singing. And one of our very favorite things that we sang were, was a series of songs by Veritas Press about events in five different eras of history. And they go through their five different songs, and each song covers 32 events from an era of history. We loved those songs. And a few years ago, we discovered that, that Veritas Press had developed an online history program to go along with that breakdown of the five eras of history and the 32 events in each era. And so we were very excited to give that a try. But my children at that point were really too young for a kind of an online program where you just, you know, send them over there with the laptop and have them do an online something by themselves. And so what we did was we just incorporated it into our morning time. And it was it was really simple, actually. All I did was my rocking chair where I sit for morning time is right beside a television in our schoolroom. And all I did was I pulled the HDMI cable out of the back of the DVD player, and I plugged it into the side of my laptop. And that way I could watch on the laptop screen, um, you know, and I could control from my laptop the activities in the course. But then the children could see on the television as they're sitting on the floor facing me, they could just watch on the television what was happening. And the Veritas Press history courses are very interactive. So there might be a small segment of maybe you know, three to five minute video, but it's interspersed with a lot of, say, drag and drop map skills or clicking to identify famous paintings or famous people. So there's a lot of interaction happening. And so we began using that just like you might use any other resource in your morning time, just like you might have a book in your basket. And every day you just pull it out and you read the next chapter and you kind of You know, you as a mom might even be experiencing that for the first time as you're reading it aloud. And so you just discuss it as you go. And we did very much the same thing with the Veritas Press History. We would watch it together. We would pause, talk about what was happening. You know, the children would take turns answering the questions and that sort of thing. And once we got going with that, it just helped me to see, first of all, you know, how many things are available online to use in that way, but also how well it fit with my personality and my personal preference. I'm really not the kind of mom that's just going to have everything all organized weeks in advance, and I'm going to have requested all the materials from the library, and I'm going to have collected all the supplies for these grand craft projects. I'm doing well if I can keep track of my Bible from day to day (laughs) to know where it is and what chapter we're supposed to be in next. So to have everything right on my laptop. And eventually we got to the point really where we just had, I had a folder on my desktop and I would pull open that folder and it had a combination of things in it. Some of them were links to things like the Veritas Press history course or other things that we were working through. Some of them were MP3 files of songs that we were singing or audio things that we were listening to. And so it was as if I had a basket. It was just in a file folder on my desktop. And we could go through, you know, and pick different things. And we did a little bit of informal looping. You know, there was no way to get to all the things we were going to do in one day. So we might do a few one day and a few the next day. And that has been a really great system for us. And we still, like I said, you know, I would still see that as, for me, personality-wise, an ideal way to organize the things that I want to share with the children, YouTube videos and all kinds of things like that. Oh, I love this. I love the idea of the digital basket. And 
you know, some of us are procrastinators. I'm not going to say who here. (laughs) And then, you know, there are people like you who have seven children. And so, you know, you're juggling a lot of responsibilities and it's not always easy to get out to the library and it's expensive to try to order everything on Amazon. Though I will say the two day shipping has saved me often. But, you know, just the idea that you could be sitting there at night kind of vegging out a little bit and clicking and dragging some things that you find that look really cool and interesting, throw them into your digital basket and the next morning get up and have a myriad of things to choose from to share with your children. That's just kind of awesome. Yes, we've really enjoyed that. Yeah, I love that. I love that a lot. You know, another thing is, displaying things like this on the big screen. You know, a lot of times, for example, Emily Kaiser was on talking about doing picture study with the kids and each child having their own copy of the picture to study. But, you know, sometimes that's not feasible for families. And so being able to take a piece of artwork and putting it up on a big screen like that and have everyone look at it at the same time, you know, there are some benefits there as well. Exactly. We've done that with Things like, for example, we want everybody to sing a hymn and previous to a more of a digital morning time, I would be typing up all the lyrics and printing out a copy for everybody to have their own copy, which would then be shredded and eaten by the end of the week. And, you know, somebody else needed a new copy or lost theirs. And so this way, you know, I have links to sites where you can see the lyrics to a hymn or even, you know, like have a MIDI file that will play the tune in case you forgot what the tune is and everybody can see the lyrics up there on the screen or even, you know, some hymns you can find interspersed in the, you know, amongst the music so you can see the notes that go along with them. And all I have to do is display it on the screen and everybody essentially has their own copy without having to do any copying and pasting and printing and keeping track of sheets or anything like that. Oh, that's awesome. And, you know, it's not so much that you were trying to solve a problem by doing your morning time this way. This was just really what fit with your personality and your family's personality. That's exactly right. Some people grow up with horses or they grow up with a mom who gardens. My dad is a computer programmer. This is what I grew up with. It feels very comfortable to me. I do my, you know, menu planning with a spreadsheet and a and a Google calendar. So this is how I roll. This is just what feels natural to me and has worked well for us. Okay. So other than some of the benefits we've already talked about, like, you know, not having uh, paper to end up in the recycle bin and things of that nature. What are some of the other benefits of using technology in morning time? One of the things that I've liked about it is just that it's a great way to familiarize my children with what's available out there, how to use it responsibly. You know, occasionally I will have a kid, you know, okay, you come sit here and take over with history for a minute while I change the baby's diaper or whatever. So For several of my children, that was really their introduction, even just in a very bare bones way to, you know, here's how to, you know, move the mouse pointer, click on things, you know, navigate with the computer. And then also demonstrating things like just how to use YouTube carefully because, you know, you want to see a video, but who knows what's going to show up on the sidebar. And, you know, just introduction to wise, safe computer use, use of technology in a careful way. And also just the idea that there's so much good online. I mean, there's a lot of bad online. And so we, you know, the idea that we can balance that message with there's a lot of good online too, you know, maybe we'll keep people going towards the good as they get older, as opposed to towards the bad. Very true. Yes. Well, what about some drawbacks? Can you think of any drawbacks to using technology in your morning time? Sure. Well, you know, one of the things that we've had to play around with a little bit is all my older children have nooks, e-readers. And at certain points, they've used those. For example, if we're going to read together something from the Bible, then maybe they'd all pull up the verses on their nooks. And, you know, in one sense, it's very handy. They're very slim, easy to keep track of, easy to use. But, you know, it's also easy for them to be distracted when they're using something like a nook. And then, you know, there's other stuff to do and pull up other things and look at other things. And you know, so like with anything else, it's, you know, kind of one of the primary skills, one of the primary qualifications for being a good homeschool mom is just knowing your children and knowing when a tool is going to be helpful for them and when it might be a hindrance. So we've had to say, you know, okay, we're going to use just paper hymnals and Bibles right now, or, you know, or this one and this one are ready to use a nook. I don't think you're quite ready for that yet, or you're ready to read along, but I don't think 
the note taking is going to be as helpful as much as it might be a distraction. So, you know, as with anything else, there are just what you said a moment ago, there are good things, there are things to be careful of. And it's really just a day by day evaluation, knowing of your children and, you know, knowing what's helpful for them. We have found one of the things that's helpful about, for example, with the hymnal or the Bible reading is that some of my struggling readers really need to be able to follow along with their finger as they're reading. And so that's kind of difficult to do when it's something that's up on a big screen. So again, it's not necessarily something bad about the technology. It's more just a matter of knowing your tools and knowing where they're useful. Awesome. Yeah. And you know, kids can be distracted by a bug crawling across the floor. So exactly. it's just another layer on a problem that we already have. So, right. well, what are some subjects that lend themselves well to the use of technology? Well, for our homeschool, I really can't think of a subject that we haven't done in a digital way. You know, as I said a moment ago, perhaps the reading, especially for those who are learning to read or struggling with reading, might be better done with something in hand, a piece of paper or a book physically in front of you. But we have done all kinds of things online. You know, similar to my inability to collect materials for craft supplies, I'm also really bad about getting to experiments, science experiments and things like that. And definitely there's value to, you know, kids getting to participate in hands-on experiments and that sort of thing. But I would say, if you know you're not going to get to an experiment on a particular topic, then being able to watch a video of it on YouTube or watch a visual demonstration of it on YouTube is a great supplement to just reading something from a textbook about it or a, you know, even a living book about it. And so we've done plenty of that. And oftentimes, one of the advantages to watching a YouTube video that we actually couldn't get from a hands-on experiment is that, you know, with all the development in digital and graphics, they're able to do so much with, you know, we might be able to do an experiment and observe what's happening. But then in a YouTube video, they might be able to intersperse it with, you know, kind of this zoom in slow motion, you know, demonstration of what's happening with the molecules or, you know, some kind of computer graphic animation that's demonstrating what's happening. We've experienced the same thing with math. We've watched quite a number of videos from both Khan Academy and Math Antics. And, you know, of course, I could sit down with a whiteboard and explain concepts or demonstrate things. We can use manipulatives. Those are all great things to do. But sometimes with the computer graphics, they're really able to demonstrate things. I remember watching a video by Math Antics about perimeter and what perimeter meant. And they actually had a little man walking around the edge of the shape to just very visually demonstrate what exactly perimeter was measuring. And that was really helpful for my children. So I don't know, Pam, I can't think of any subjects where I would say there's nothing to be gained from using digital, especially in supplement to other things that you're doing. Right, right. And just the fact that they're not going to put up the YouTube video unless the science experiment actually works is a bonus. <laughs> That is a great point. Yes. Because I cannot tell you. Had failed. Yes. How many times I've stood in the kitchen and I'm like, well, it's supposed to be doing this, but it's not. <laughs> yes. We have had that experience too. Exactly. Okay. Well, so let's talk about where do we find good stuff for, and I'm kind of throwing you on the spot here because you mentioned math antics and that made me think, oh, we need to come up with some places where we can find some really good math or science. So how do I know where to go on YouTube to find the right videos or, you know, to find the, the quality things to use in my morning time? That is a great question. I'll be real honest. From my perspective, I'm kind of coming at this from the other angle, which is that there's so much good stuff out there that I'm really more in the place of having to say, okay, there's no way we can do all of this. And I'm going to have to eliminate and I'm going to have to narrow it down to, you know, we can't do all five of these things for history. We're going to have to pick one or we're going to have to, you know, maybe have this as our main one and supplement here and there with that. Because at this point, I feel like wherever I go, Facebook, Pinterest, you know, just other moms, blogs, and things that homeschool moms have shared everywhere. There's uh, lists of, you know, 100 great YouTube channels to teach science or five great apps that help you practice your math. And so my problem isn't so much finding them, but it is what you mentioned, which is, you know, kind of evaluating and narrowing it down. And, you know, I don't know that there's one surefire answer to that question other than maybe just read up a little bit you know, check out some of the videos yourself. Sometimes in the end, there's just no substitute for 
a little bit of trial and error, just like you would with paper books. You know, you'd read about a curriculum or you'd read about a book and maybe you'd try to see if you could get it from the library for free before you paid money for it. But, you know, in the end, even other people's opinions don't always give you what you need because your family is unique and your needs are unique. And so sometimes it's just going to come down to you're just going to have to give it a try, maybe on your own or maybe incorporate it with the children and see how it goes. And one of the benefits of digital is that there doesn't seem to be such um, a high front end investment necessarily so that, you know, if you buy a curriculum and then it turns out to not work, you feel a little more pressure like, oh, maybe we should stick with this because we've already kind of signed up for it or, or paid for it. But with your you know, finding a new YouTube channel to see if it's going to be helpful. And it turns out to be kind of a dud. No big deal. Move on, find another one or, you know, just replace it with something else. Okay. So it sounds like this is a two-step process and step one is to Google and step two (laughs) is to preview. And then I would say, right. Yes. That sounds right. Awesome. Okay. Do you have any uh, just personal favorite apps or programs other than you mentioned Khan Academy, Math Antics, the Veritas Press History, anything else that you would like to recommend that people could start their journey with checking out? Uh, Well, hands down, my number one favorite place to send people is Beth Napoli's. Her online name is the Techie Homeschool Mom. And she's been a great resource for me personally for all kinds of online resources, digital tools, all kinds of things like that. And she has a website called Online Unit Studies. And, you know, she's been doing unit studies, interest-led types of activities with her children for years. She's a mom of five girls. And within the past several years, she began developing online unit studies. So all the resources that she's pulling are websites and YouTube videos and online activities A lot of the projects that go along with the unit studies are actually digital projects where you're using online slideshow creators and graphics design programs and things like that to actually produce your project or your product at the end of the lesson. And so she's been making these unit studies available for other homeschool moms to use. And they're on a wide variety of topics and she's always adding to them. So I have a post on my blog, for example, of uh, where we started using her famous artist online unit study. It's great. It's got a lesson about each famous artist from a particular art movement. So you're not only learning the biography of the artist, but also some great facts about the movement that they represent and then projects to do to go along with what you're learning. And it was exactly suited for our digital morning time because we could sit there together. We could look at it together, watch a video We looked at, for example, lots of pictures. You were talking earlier about art study. We looked at lots of pictures of Audubon's birds and did activities with that and just lots of great exposure to things that I don't know that I would have known how to present or what order to put them in or what kinds of things would be important to point out about them. But you can read more on the blog about that project and how we worked through that unit study and also I'm going to be offering a free lesson from one of the online unit studies for my readers. So you may want to check that out as well. Okay. Well, we will definitely link to that one where you write about Beth's studies in the show notes for this episode. So everyone will be able to go over and find it. And I'm excited because that sounds like something that would be right up my alley. So we really enjoyed that one. It was great. Okay, so let's talk a little bit because there may be some moms out there who are listening to this and they're thinking, okay, this sounds kind of cool. I might want to try this. If for nothing else than just the ease of putting things together at the last minute, but they're wondering what kind of equipment do I need in order to incorporate some technology into my morning time? So what would you recommend for most people? You know, I really don't have anything fancy to share at this point. I would say that at its bare minimum, you really could do a digital morning time just sitting on the sofa with your laptop on your lap and your kids around you. We have enough children now where that was going to be logistically a little bit difficult. And so, you know, as I said earlier, we just had the kids sitting on the floor at chairs facing the television. And I was able to connect my laptop to the television with a an HDMI cable. Many people may already have one. It probably came with your DVD player and it's connecting your DVD to your television. But if you don't have one, they're only about $5 on Amazon. So they're really not hard to pick up. 
Another fancier way to go is that there are some options like Chromecast or things like that where you can broadcast what's on your computer to your television. If you have a smart TV, you might be able to, you know, broadcast, say, look up a YouTube video on your phone and then have it play on your television. So there are lots of options, but it really doesn't have to be a big learning curve to getting started. Like I said, you could just start by sitting on the sofa or laying down on the floor and looking at what's on the screen of the laptop. Right, right. Now, we have an Apple TV, and so we're actually able to project our we don't really have an iPad anymore. Ours is so old and we've never replaced it. But we used to be able to project our iPad to the TV or the computer. So mm-hmm. that's kind of like the Chromecast thing you were talking about. And exactly. uh, the HDMI cable, yeah. And if you don't know how to do that, your teen probably could hook that up exactly. for you. Yeah, I mean, it's really just, you know, unplug and plug into a, just like you'd plug in any kind of a USB device or anything like that. Yeah, you're going to find a hole somewhere on the side of your computer, your laptop, where that cable will plug into. Exactly. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's say we're sitting here one morning and we're ready to try this and we have everything set up. We're ready to do morning time and our technology fails. Maybe our Wi-Fi isn't working that morning. Do you have any tips for me? This happens. Yes. So, well, you know, probably just about the same thing you would do if you were sitting down to do your morning basket and you couldn't locate one of your resources. You would just sort of improvise or say, well, I guess we'll just skip that for today. Now, obviously, if your entire morning time is on your laptop and you have no Wi-Fi, then that's a problem. But, you know, our morning time is always kind of a varied combination. So, for example, even if we were going to do hymns and Bible reading on the laptop, we could just shift to doing that paper. If you don't have Wi-Fi, you can't get to your YouTube videos, but you can still listen to the digital MP3s that you've ripped, you know, of learning songs onto your laptop. So there might be parts of that you could do and save another piece until later. And, you know, in my home, it never happens that we need one more thing to do to fill up a slot of time. It more often happens that we just can't get to all of it. So I have never had the circumstance where we're just all sitting around with our mouths gaping open and we have nothing else that we could fill that slot with, you know, because we don't have Wi-Fi. So that's not a difficulty that I've run into a lot, although I can see how, you know, a mom looking into planning this way might have that concern. So I would say if that's a concern, have something in your back pocket, have a great read aloud to pull out. Okay, so just be flexible with what you have going on. And I love the thing you're talking about, okay, you've downloaded, you've ripped some of these CDs, you have the paper Bible handy, you have the paper hymnal ready, so you can just kind of punt if you need to, if you're faced with some kind of challenge. Exactly. If you're a homeschool mom, you know how to be flexible. Isn't that the truth? (laughs) All right. Well, do you think there are any subjects or situations where technology is not the way to go in morning time? Nope. (laughs) Well, you know, as I said before, it's not so much that I think there's a perhaps a subject where that wouldn't apply more, I would say, circumstantially, depending on what you're going to learn or your particular student and what you're going to work on, you know, perhaps if you're something where you're going to want to have some hands-on manipulation, math manipulative, rearranging letter tiles, or, you know, a new reader who's going to want to be able to follow along with a finger as they're reading, obviously learning to play a musical instrument. I don't think they're the kind of thing where a mom would get herself set up with some digital learning and then just realize that it was a really bad idea. I think they're the kind of circumstances where, you know, common sense would dictate that technology might not be the way to go for that particular learning subject. You know, one of the things I let my kids do is play with Play-Doh or put together puzzles or play with pattern blocks or something like that while they're listening to me read or while they're reciting their memory work. Does that work when you're using this more digital technology or do you find that they're more looking at the screen? Yeah, so just like I would do with any other subject, I have to think about whether it's something that I need them to look at or not. So even when we're doing activities that aren't digital, my decisions about whether to, for example, let them paint or let them, you know, draw or my daughter likes to knit. So there are times where I say, yeah, if you know what, you want to grab something to draw, you want to grab your knitting, go right ahead. And then there are other times where I say, okay, I need, I need your hands free because I need you to be able to look at what I'm showing you. Like maybe a map skills activity where I need them to look at the map rather than at their knitting or their drawing or whatever. And so I think the same 
has proved to be true with the technology. I mean, if I'm playing an audio book, obviously that's a great opportunity for them to draw or knit or paint or do, you know, Play-Doh, whatever they're keeping their hands busy with. And if it's something where, you know, with the with the online history where they're learning map skills, well, that'd be a time where they probably need their hands free so they can have their eyes on, on what's on the screen. Right, right. Well, what about the debate about the impact of technology on kids and how much is too much? What's your take on this issue and how does it fit in with using technology so heavily in your homeschool? Yeah, that, you know, I was thinking about that as we prepare for our conversation. And I just, you know, I think, don't hear me say that there are no dangers to technology because I think that we've definitely had a healthy conversation about, you know, in the broader homeschool community online, a a good conversation about how to use technology carefully. But as I was considering it related to morning time, I think, you know, perhaps the things that people are concerned about center more around independent use of technology. And I could be wrong, maybe ask me further if there's anything particular you're thinking about, but, you know, concerns about being too consumed with, say, social media use as a opposed to real life relationships or spending too much time on video games or something like that where you're not keeping up with your responsibilities. I had a hard time coming up with anything that would be a concern to me in the setting of morning time simply because it's still pretty parent directed. So, you know, mommy is choosing what we're going to do next and how long we're going to spend on it and we're doing it all together so it's actually still quite a social fellowshipping kind of event, even though it's maybe a YouTube video we're watching instead of a chapter book that we're reading, we're really still engaged with each other, having conversation. So I think maybe some of the things that people would be concerned about with relation to technology might even be aided by a technological morning time, because as we talked about earlier, just that kind of modeling of how to make wise use of things and how to just, you know, use technology as a tool, but not let it master you. Yeah, I love that answer. And just the idea that you can just open up the entire world to your kids through that screen in ways that you really can't otherwise is good. And so you're not talking about completely and totally replacing the family read aloud or the book, but supplementing it and providing alternatives sometimes and just looking at things in ways that you can't through the book, you know, on that video screen. Absolutely. I think, you know, we just, as human beings, we have a little bit of a fear of anything that's new, anything that's different, you know, and that's not wholly bad. I mean, we should be cautious. We should be wise. Use just common sense. But, you know, I don't think we need to fear something just because it's on a digital screen as opposed to a printed page. Right. And moderation, moderation always with everything. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, too much chocolate cake. It's a bad thing, sadly. <laughs> Right. And just like with anything else, I mean, you don't put the Halloween candy on the table and then tell your three-year-old, you know, use your best judgment, sweetie. The younger they are, the more they need mommy saying, this is enough. That's too much. And then you want to work your way out of a job. I mean, you don't want to be calling your, you know, 24-year-old and saying, I hope you haven't eaten more than two pieces of candy today. So, you know, it's this, it's this know your child, you know, understand not just their chronological age, but their maturity, their particular strengths and weaknesses and and give them guidance in that, which is kind of what you're doing, you know, when you have a digital morning time. Yeah, that's great. Well, Lena, this conversation has really excited me. And I just want to thank you so much for coming here and joining us today to give us this fascinating glimpse into what you're doing in your morning time. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been my privilege. And there you have it. Now for the basket bonus for today's podcast, we have for you a list of resources that you might want to add to your own morning time to make it a little more digital. These digital morning time resources are from Lena and they will help get you started adding a bit of technology to your day. You can find those along with links to all of the books and resources we spoke about on the podcast today at pambarnhill.com forward slash YMB31. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another great morning time topic. Until then, keep seeking truth, goodness, and beauty in your homeschool day.